Chris, how, how have people in your life reacted to your spiritual path? Is it something that you openly convey or only communicate if asked directly? I know most Eastern spiritual traditions don't proselytize, but how can we help others otherwise? Well, um, first and foremost, um, I'm very open about um, the practices that I do and, and and the spiritual process. It's not something that as soon as I meet somebody, I'm like, <laughs> you got the Easter logo on the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a stamper, but don't. No, I, it's not something that I you know jump right out and tell them right away. But you know, it's changed me so much in in many ways, and in a lot of ways, I'm. St- I'm still the same person, but... Did anybody ask you, does Isha, Isha make the clutch plates or the brake pads? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and people say, what is this Isha technology? For, you know, wh- what is this, you know? And, and then I'm like, well... You say it's the throttle of my car. <laughs> it's the heart. It's the engine. It's the engine. that. Ma- it's what makes the car roar. How about that? So, um, you know, in response to the question, um, my family has been great. Um, Ever since these things started happening to me, my family has has opened it with has accepted it with open arms. At first, you know, coming from um, an Italian Roman Catholic tradition, you know, everybody goes to church every every Sunday and you know all the holidays. And I always did my whole life, and I went to Catholic school and uh, CCD, all those things. So, for them to accept right away that, you know, I'm doing something that's different. It, it has nothing to do with my religion because, you know, obviously I'm still Roman Catholic and whatnot, but, you know, at first I think it was kind of hard for them because they didn't really know what it was. You know, where I grew up, I never even heard the word spiritual process till after I went to the inner engineering program. I didn't even know there was such a thing. You know, I heard of people that were spiritual, but all I thought that was was they were religious. I didn't know there was any such thing as the spiritual process. I didn't know what it was. So I think at first it was a bit of a challenge for them to kind of wrap their head around it. But shortly after, you know, six, eight months after I did the program and they saw all the changes that were happening within me and my health skyrocket, you know, the acceptance came really fast. And really fast they said, where's that inner engineering program again? And... Um, maybe we're interested in signing up because, you know, they wanted a little bit of what was happening to me. So, you know, after that, um, both my parents have have done the internet engineering program with you and three of my four sisters. Um, It's been a wonderful ride, I I must say that. And a lot of people that say I haven't seen in a long time, that the second they see me now, right away, they're like, something's different about you. And, and at first, they can't put their finger on it, but they'll come back and say, we've never seen you calm like this. Like, I was always... Well, they call this calm? This is calm. <laughs> That's the scary part. This is calm. I was always running a million miles a minute, always. And now the fact that I can even sit kind of still is unbelievable to them. The fact that I can you know, sit in one place and, and not want to go nuts, is, it's a miracle. So I can't speak for I can't speak for cultures around the uh, I can only speak from my experience and my experience is you know it hasn't been hard at all sure at first people that don't understand what's happening with me are a little they're a little taken back cuz they they have their own ideas they don't really know and it's perfectly understandable but the second you spend some time and see that, wow, I'm, I'm really okay with whatever is happening. And it allows me to live my life very effortlessly. It's not going to be very long until you want a piece of it, too. So, I mean, that's just how I look at it. I'm very open with my practice and, and, uh, and my system. I would like to correct the question itself because uh, now uh, when you say Eastern spiritual traditions, you have a certain idea about it. We do not know what this person is exposed to. Uh, This is not a tradition. This is not a philosophy. This is not an ideology. This is not a teaching either. This is a technology. Nobody can be for any technology or against any technology. 
you can only use it. You don't have to take vows by it, nor do you have to be against it. Nobody needs to be for or against it, you just have to learn to use it. Even with technology, people take this attitude with a certain level of immaturity. Now there are two religions in America, the apple and the blackberry <laughs> Just technologies. Yes. It's a question of what's suitable for your life and you use that technology. But now you could make this into a religion of your own. People are, you know, yeah. <laughs> very excited about these things. I love my apple too. So, your apple. I'm Blackberry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, now I think uh, apple is too fanciful, Blackberry is just work. You think without the half-eaten apple you cannot exist, <laughs> okay? So this need not be there. A technology is just technology. For what work you're doing, is this technology useful? Now, whatever work you may be doing, if there is a technology to keep you peaceful, joyful, blissful, pleasant within yourself on all levels, when I say pleasantness, see if you become pleasant in your body, we call this health which you are experiencing. If you become very pleasant, we call this pleasure. Nothing to be done from outside, it's just in dripping with pleasure, simply sitting here. If you become pleasant in your mind, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call this joy. If you become pleasant in your emotions, we call this love. If you become very pleasant, we call it compassion. If you become pleasant in your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. So, this is what every human being is looking for. He wants to be pleasant on the inside and he wants pleasantness on the outside. If your outside becomes pleasant, that's called success <laughs> This is all anybody is looking for all the time. It doesn't matter which religion you belong to, which culture is you belong to, where you come from, whether you come from North America or North Pole. Everybody wants this, isn't it? Yes. Whether you… you are from Arizona or you are an Eskimo, you still want it. Yes. Your ideas of success may be different, but the experience of success is not different, isn't it? No. Whether you went and won a race in a record-breaking time and went and stood on the podium, what experience you have. And two kids are running and, you know, just on the street and he ran faster than the other, what experience is It's not different. It's not different at all. It's just you are relating your experience too much to other people's appreciation, which is a wrong way to live. If the whole world says this, it shouldn't make a difference. If the whole world says this, it shouldn't make a difference. If you are living at your full… full level of pleasantness possible within you, full level of competence, you are ex exploring all the time, and everything that's possible, you are on full throttle. If you are, you will see whether somebody does this to you or this to you makes no difference. So now, don't… stop calling this Eastern or Western. Technology is neither Eastern nor Western. Technology is just that which works. So, so that you don't have any doubt about this, that's why I labeled it as inner engineering. Engineering means doing things the way it works. You want your car to be well engineered, right? Yeah, absolutely. But what about yourself? I'd is it not very important that I am well engineered within myself, so at least I am happening the way I want myself to be? We want to engineer something because we want it to have it the way we want it. So before you have anything in this world the way you want it, the most important thing is that you have this one the way you want it. Yes. If this one thing is not the way you want it, nothing is ever going to be nice for you. So this is just a technology and technology can be easily spoken to, can be conveyed, can be conveyed even technologically through technological means which we are doing online these days. Mm -hmm. So whatever your culture may be, whatever your religion may be, you can still use a cell phone. Okay, we are divided on the brand but 
<laughs> I won't hold it against you, though. I promise. <laughs> so, uh, whatever it may be, we can still use it if you learn to use it. So, whatever your religion may be, whatever your culture may be, whatever your belief systems may be, you can still learn to use this gadget. This is the gadget, please know this. This is the most sophisticated gadget on the planet. If you learn to use it, life will become incredible. Beyond all your wildest imaginations, life will become so absolutely incredible. If you just know where the keyboard is for this one <laughs> Or the starter. I think they have a starter. Don't tell me they didn't get started. <laughs> what if they can't find the pedals? Yes. That's the problem. They don't know where the throttle is. That's the problem. <laughs> Hopefully the shift linkage is working too. <laughs> okay, today I broke the shift linkage. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. These things happen, you know. We go out and we race a car hard and… No, know. that's because I didn't… I raced it hard. It was fragile. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I weakened it, you know. I weakened it before. <laughs> Okay. Oh, this question is for you, Sadhguru. I would like… Sadhguru, I would like to have an experience like you had in Chamundi Hills. And afterwards, I want to experience the utmost pleasantness within myself, as you say. I would like to be enlightened. What can I do to bring that process about? Oh. Wow. Ah, uh, who wouldn't want the fruit? Who wouldn't want the fruit? Who would not want the fruit? Everybody. No, I'm not talking about apples. <laughs> Everybody would want the fruit of life, isn't it? Yes. However you perceive it, different people perceive this in different ways. Now, he's understanding the fruit of life as enlightenment. You may understand it as victory, somebody else may understand it as money, somebody else may understand it as love, it doesn't matter. What is how you perceive the fruit? But is there somebody who does not want the fruit of life? Everybody wants the fruit of life. So if you want the fruit, the most important thing is that you never bother about the fruit. You just nurture the root, that's how the fruit happens. It's the root, not the fruit. Right. If you just pay attention to the root, what it needs, fruit will invariably come. Nobody can deceive you from that. But you don't nurture the root, you're too focused on the fruit. You know, these days we're saying we're goal-oriented societies. Yes. <laughs> so we're only dreaming of things, they will not come. I know there are people going about saying, don't do anything, just Wish and it'll manifest, okay? This dream can be sold only to those who are not successful in their life. This dream can never be sold to the successful because people who are successful in whatever they're doing, they clearly know that if they do not nurture the roots of their life, no fruit will come. Yes. It's a simple farmer to a racer, to a scientist, to a yogi, everybody knows this. Yes. Only somebody who's done nothing with their life believe that without nurturing the root, you can have a fruit. Yes, you can steal from your neighbor's garden, but you can't do that every day, you know <laughs> or you, get, you might well, you'll get caught someday. But you can't do it every day, and it's always going to be a desperate life. The joy of producing a lot of fruit, you eating it and distributing it all over is different. You trying to steal one fruit from somebody else is a very different experience. Even if you manage to steal every day, it's a very different experience of life. You will not know the joy of the fruit. You will have the fruit in your hand, but you will not know the joy of the fruit, is it? So essentially I want you to understand, when you say enlightenment, you're talking about the ultimate fruit of life. And you're also mentioning and uh, not only that and what happened afterward, but you're not interested in what happened before. <laughs> the process that I went through before that, not interested. You're only interested in the harvest. Don't be interested in the harvest so much. Yes, harvest is important in the end, but you don't have to bother about the harvest if you take care of the cultivation and planting and seeding and everything properly. Harvest will come, why will it not come? 
So you must have been asking, the question you should have been asking, Sadhguru, what did you do? So that such a miraculous thing happened to you on Chamundi Hill. No, you're asking all the things that happened afterward are too fantastic. How can I get it? All right, that's how you look at it, it's fine. But I want you to know this. This is one thing you can do. One simple thing you can do is just this. This is the only thing I did in my life. One thing is, when I was three, four years of age, I clearly realized that I know nothing about life, which is a fact even today for everybody, you know. You actually know nothing. I only realized that a couple of years ago. <laughs> no, not only in that sense, I'm, I'm going much further. When you say life, you know this body, you know many things to the extent as to how to use it. See, we know how to use an atom today. But do you actually know what's an atom? Nobody knows fully, absolutely what an atom is. Nobody really knows it. But we have learned how to use it. Similarly, many, many things, whether it's water or air or earth or anything, we have learned to use it. Our knowledge is only that far. But you do not know what it is. You can make fruits come out of something out of… simply out of your women, fancy, only when you know what it is. You may know how to use this right now, but you do not know what this is. You have taken too many inputs from too many people. Too many people have been teaching you things that they themselves do not know. So, one thing that I realized was I do not know anything. Another thing is, because I could clearly see everybody around me also did not know anything, but they were going around with authority <laughs> as if they know it. So I did not take any input, so I keep joking with people. The only thing that I have done to get here is, I remained uneducated and that's not a simple thing. Because from the day you are born, everybody is trying to educate you about things which have not worked in their life. Just do these two things. What's his name? Chris. Chris. Just do, do these uh, two things, uh, Chris, that you see that you actually know nothing about anything in this existence, including yourself. And uh, don't take in other people's opinions, ideas, philosophies, nothing. Your culture, your religion, your people, your family, your genetics, all this influence, you learn to keep it aside and just pay attention to life process. If you keep your intelligence unentangled, if you keep the, the process of your intellect completely unentangled, in culture or religion or ideology or dogma or any kind of belief or any kind of thing, if you keep your intelligence absolutely unentangled in any way encumbered with anything, the very nature of human intelligence is that it will naturally take you towards enlightenment. Which human being, if he does not assume things, which human being can avoid Simple questions about life, fundamental questions about life. Okay, where did I come from? Where will I go? What is the nature of my existence? Who can avoid this? For all these things you have ready-made answers that somebody else told you, you read a book, somebody said something or you just cooked up your own belief system. Don't assume anything. Just simply make the question profound enough. If the question sinks deep enough, the answer is right there. And you now, for example, for all the wrong reasons, I learned yoga at the age of uh, ten or eleven years of age. It happened like this. Uh, even then, I was looking for excitement, and uh, when we go to my grandfather's place in the backyard, there's a well which is about uh, about six to eight feet in diameter and goes about hundred fifty feet down. We are always there in summer, so it's at least down by sixty to seventy feet drop. So one of the sport for us is, for the kids, we jump into this well. You have to go straight like a racing machine, mm -hmm. okay? 
If you go like this, your brains will become a smear on the wall. And to come up, you go and hit the water at a certain speed and coming up, there is no ladder, there is no any kind of footholds, nothing, you just have to hold the rock and come. By the time you come, the sheer pressure of it, all your fingernails will be bleeding, just the pressure of uh, holding on to it and all your knees are scraped and everything. So we want to do it and I'm pretty good at it. One day we were doing this and an old man over seventy years of age came by. He was just watching us. They ignored, he's too old to be noticed, you know. <laughs> like people think about me now <laughs> And he just went and jumped into the well. I thought, this is it, he's finished. But to my amazement, he came up faster than me. Suppose today I drove faster than you, you would… Uh... <laughs> so that's what happened to me. I'd hand you the helmet <laughs> <laughs> So he came up faster than me. So I kept my pride aside and asked, okay, how? He said, come and do yoga. So I followed him. He taught me some simple yogic practices. At the age of eleven, I was just about eleven at that time, I started. Till I was twenty-five years of age, without a single day's break I did it. I had no spiritual inclinations. My only thing is physically, mentally I want to excel, I want to be somewhere. So it definitely set me apart, both physically and mentally. In any group of people it set me apart, no doubt. The yogic practices did that to me. I never imagined there's another dimension to it. So whatever this Chamundi Hill experience is, that's what, that was a surprise for me. <laughs> there's something else packed into it. Now I'm talking to you about all these things, there's something else in it. I'm talking about the fruit too much these days because you guys won't get started unless there's a fruit. And that day I went in to yoga only because this old man could climb up the well faster than me. And it just freaked me. I had to do it. So why, why I'm telling you this is even if you do… if you get into something for wrong reasons, but if you do the right thing, it still works. That's how this universe works. It is not your intention. It is, are you doing the right thing or no? So you want to get the fruit of life, that's not going to get you the fruit. Are you doing the right things about it? These two right things you implement, and uh, anyway you're talking about all this, so probably you're initiated already. So you keep up the practice and just clearly observe every bit of life around you. A leaf, a flower, your little finger, look at this pen, watch this little finger for eight hours, let me see, and see what do you know about this. You don't know a single cell in the body properly. Pay attention, once you realize that I do not know, you will invariably pay attention. If human consciousness pays enough attention, there is nothing in the universe which cannot yield. Everything in the universe has to yield and it will yield. Even the creator will yield if you pay enough attention. That is the power of human consciousness. It is just that it needs to be held in attention. It is sleepy and drowsy, then it looks like it can do nothing. You just hold it in attention, it can do things that you have never ever thought was possible. It can open the whole cosmos for you. All right. Dear Sadhguru, on one hand the involvement and participation of people in the spiritual… in spiritual matters is enormous now. On the other, negative aspects such as corruption, violence, etc. are also rising. Why this conflict and how can individuals contribute positively? Oh, that's from Chennai <laughs> hmm. Spiritual awareness is… Uh, yes, definitely it's more alive than it's been in the last century, I would say, which is a good sign. But a lot of people are getting into spiritual process like you, that they break up 
and to fix themselves, they get into spiritual process. Okay, they somehow got into it, it's fine. But still people are waiting for something to go wrong in their life. I want you to understand it this way. Spiritual process essentially means to know this one, to know this piece of life absolutely. If you want to drive your machine, well, the more you know about it, the better off you are, isn't it? Yes. Otherwise you don't have to go to the garage, let them build a car, you just take it in the race, racetrack and swing it, it's not going to work like that. No. You just have to know what's gone into it. You just have to know as much as possible about the machine. That's when you can drive it well. If that is so with a car, if that's so with your cell phone, is this not true with this gadget? Yes. The more you know about it, the better. So spiritual process is not something that you start at the end of your life when you are no good for anything or when something has gone wrong. This is something that must begin at the beginning of your life. Before you step into active life, there must be a spiritual process in everybody's life. This is how it used to be in India just a few generations ago, but for whatever reasons that's been broken now and you know, people go into it after things have gone wrong with themselves. Life should begin with spiritual process. Why people think spiritual process is the end of life is because they have a negative, completely negative image of what a spiritual process is. Like the first question indicated, yes. if you turn spiritual, you will become no good for anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, you will be good for just about anything. If you turn spiritual, you will be good for just about anything in the world and beyond, I'm telling you <laughs> So, Spiritual process definitely is on the rise, that's a good thing. Corruption is on the rise, it's always been there. It is just that today there is more money to be made. Earlier they were doing petty levels of corruption, today they are in, they're doing mega-sized corruption in New the technology. world and particularly in India where he's talking from. Because uh, everything is happening on a larger scale. It is not that people have not been stealing money from each other in the past. They were doing it then also. But the volumes were small, so you didn't see it as very big. Now the volumes have become so big. To handle this much volume, no more individual people can be handling those things. We need effective systems to handle it because the volumes have increased so much, like never before. So wherever there are no proper systems, naturally individual people will exploit it and make the situation very corrupt, which is what he is talking about. About violence, let me inform you, the world is less violent than ever before. Now we are sitting here in Los Angeles. Thousand years ago, if we were sitting here and thousand people died in Chennai, is it off? It's gone off? If thousand people died in Chennai, we would be sitting here looking at the sunset, looking at the ocean and the bay and think world is absolutely wonderfully peaceful. Yes. Now something is happening in Egypt, still not many people dead fortunately, a little bit of heat. But now the fires of Cairo are burning in your own house through your television, through your internet. It's burning in your sitting room, it's burning in your bedroom. I don't know if you have a television in your bathroom. It's burning on my iPhone too. Huh? It's burning it's on burning my burning on your phone, burning into your head. So, it is our ability to communicate which makes it look like all the blood and gore flows into our homes. Yes. Thousand years ago, if thousand people died in Chennai, we would sit here thinking the world is going perfectly well because the sun is setting, we are looking at the ocean and everything is wonderful. So do not uh, unnecessarily go this way because violence is there, definitely we have to strive to see how this doesn't happen, that is always there. But do not magnify it in your mind because whatever you pay most attention to, that is, that is what will manifest in your life and in the world around you. Everything in the world has been going wonderfully today except a few incidents in Cairo and maybe in a few other places. Sun came up on time, the earth is spinning properly, flowers are blossoming, any number of people are doing wonderful things to each other. 
A few people do nasty things to each other. Yes, those things have to be handled, but do not pay magnified attention to this because that will fill your consciousness and you will in turn create the same situations in the world. It's very important that we curtail the negative situations on the planet. At the same time, it is very, very important that we fan and nurture the positive situations on the planet. If you pay too much attention to the negative, our children will believe that this is all that's happening in the world yes. and they will believe that this is the way to live. So world is not all violent, all corrupt. There are many wonderful, peaceful, joyful, loving human beings on the planet, every day doing wonderful, incredible things to themselves and to each other. A few nasty things are happening or a lot of nasty things are happening, let's say. Yes, we need to fix them. But you are not going to fix that. When your mind and your consciousness is full of violence that you saw on the television today, unfortunately, only negative things are considered news. Only negative things are considered newsworthy. All the wonderful things that human beings do, somewhere we have set up a mode in the society that it's not newsworthy. So it's time that we develop a caliber of journalism on the planet which highlights the positive on the planet. This does not mean glossing over the negative. Yes, we must face the negative, no question about it. We must fix the negative, no question about it. But it's very, very important the positive is nurtured. I take another question. Um, hello, Chris. All the car racers should have a highly concentrated mind, mind control to make right decisions very quickly. How do you guys generally develop such capability? Is it by, is it by interest or by sadhana towards what you are, what you would want to be? Wow. Mind control. Right decisions very quickly. Wow. Are they talking about? Is he, is he talking about you? I hope he's not talking about me. I wish I had mind control. No, just kidding. Um, wow. Let me think about that. Yes, every driver is, it's very important for a driver to have a high level of concentration. If you can't focus all your attention, as Sadhguru was saying, to one thing, you know, there's no way that you can really excel in that, you know. Um, not that you have to have mind control or say, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. It's, it's not that. At least I don't, I don't feel it's that. And in my experience, I was always very passionate about going fast and about having uh, such mach machines on the edge. But I paid attention, close attention to that line, the line that he was also speaking about, you know, the line that you can't cross. So, again, it's, it's not that I sit there and... and and say, oh, I have to focus on this, I have to focus on this. It's, I know where the importance is. I've been, been successful to an extent in racing, and um, it's not because, again, I sit there and tell myself, oh, I must do this, I must do that. It's, um, I guess it's kind of hard to explain. Um, I know where my focus is. When you're driving a car, especially at speeds, you know, 180, 200 miles per hour, it's very important to keep your eye on the ball. Now, with that said, if you just worry about the ball the whole time, you're not going to worry, you're never going to get, never even going to get in the ballpark because, again, the ball is the goal, you know, and, and if you're just worried about that, there's many things that lead up to that, like many things that have to do with driving. Like if I just sit there and think about, I got to win the race, I got to win the race, I got to win the race, the race will start and I'll smash right into the guy in front of me because I'm just thinking about the win. I'm not thinking about what I have to do at the time. Bottom line is there's many steps to anything we're doing, whether it's racing a car or teaching a program or baking a cake or anything for that matter. And, um, you know, again, as Sadhguru was saying, as, as long as you nurture the right steps 
to doing whatever it is you're going to do, it's only natural that the result will come. So again, it's, it's not about having mind control or, or um, lightning fast reactions. Sure, all, the, all those things will help in certain aspects. But again, it's just being able to calm down, take a look around and, and really see what it is you're trying to do and take the right steps just to walk down that path. Not try to jump to the end, but to, you know, one step at a time and um, slowly move down that pack of path. Eventually, if you keep going in the right direction, you're going to get there. So there are two things. Uh, like, for example, when, uh, when you're driving at those speeds, the physical situation in which you are makes your mind naturally focused. That's one way of doing it. But it's very important that if you can do that, when the physical situations are not compelling you to do that, that you can just remain absolutely focused even when you're not driving at two hundred miles per hour. Anyway, the planet is moving faster than that, you know. <laughs> so if you can just sit here, just remain absolutely focused without any physical compulsions around you, you will see the physical compulsions will have no impact on you. So when he says mind control or uh, concentration, yes it is there. Everybody will get into a very focused state if you physically threaten them in a certain way. That's what the car is doing to you. It's physically threatening your life yes. every moment. Yes. So naturally you remain there. Just your survival instincts keep your mind focused. But this one-pointedness of the mind is uh, the essence of yogic process. When you are not physically compelled, you still keep yourself absolutely one-pointed because if it does not concentrate… See, right now, if you take a magnifying glass, simple sunlight in which everybody is comfortable can burn through your hand if you just focus it. That's what is the power of the mind and consciousness. If you focus it in a certain way, then it just breaks through everything. It burns through just about anything. That's what I said. There is no door in the existence that human consciousness cannot open if it's willing to pay enough attention. So racing or many other sports and other situations like that is… Without doing yoga, you're beginning to taste it a little bit because physical situations are compelling you there. So what you are enjoying is a certain yogic moment being forced by a, a rattling machine. But I am saying you can sit here and do it. I've definitely s tasted a small piece of yes, that. Yes, you have. For sure. I think… Uh, a little bit of time. Okay. Well, um, seven spiritual gurus talk of 2012 as a time of human consciousness. Uh, excuse me. Seven spiritual gurus talk of 2012 as a time where human consciousness can really be elevated to the next level on earth itself. Entering into a spiritual, spiritually conductive environment, is there any special significance to this period? I don't attach any importance to numbers because numbers are invented in human mind. The planet earth does not know it's 2012. It's a human idea. We started counting when we were capable of counting. Okay? Planet has been there before that. But definitely 2012 can be a surge of human consciousness because uh, one thing is, I have plans for 2011 and 12 which are big time, which will definitely raise human consciousness. And for the very first time in probably I don't know how many thousand years, or I think it is the very first time, we have managed to get all the gurus in India on one platform. This is going to have impact on human consciousness for sure. People following various different kinds of paths, different kinds of systems, we have put all of them on one, one platform which we call as Guru Sangamam. It's a confluence of the gurus. So, we have plans, not a prediction. People who are incapable of a plan are always looking for a prediction. It's 2012 going to be the rise of human consciousness. Don't look at it that way. Are we going to make it happen? Tell me, are we going to make it happen? We have to make That's it all. Happen. Yourself, anonymous person. Please don't be anonymous. Don't remain anonymous in the world. It's time you stand up 
and see that it happens. Human consciousness must rise because today technologically in terms of human empowerment we reached a place where we have the necessary capability, resource and technology to address every human problem on the planet like uh, fundamental nourishment, health, education, you name it. Every human issue on the planet, we have the ability to address it. The only thing that's missing is co inclusive consciousness. If this one thing we bring about, life can be better than ever before for the human beings on this planet because never before were human beings empowered the way we are empowered today only thing that's missing is consciousness. So now will you wait for a prediction to come true or will you make it happen? I have a plan. Please join the plan. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. <laughs> that's good. <laughs>